Hi, and welcome back. We finished Newton's laws, and now we're going to start chapter nine, which is work and kinetic energy. Chapter 10 will be about potential energy and the conservation of energy. We're going to use still Newton's laws, really nothing new, but we're going to combine Newton's laws with some math, and that math will give us this concept of work this concept of kinetic energy and potential uh, potential energy and then we'll talk about mechanical energy in order to do that i'm going to very uh, the very first thing i'm going to start with is talk about vectors again and in particular a particular property of vectors or a particular product of vectors called the dot product of two vectors because the definition of work will involve the dot product. And so that's what I'm going to talk about first. So here is a vector, let's call it vector A. So I'm going to say the dot, dot product. So this lecture will be a little bit more math than uh, um, than usual. However, once we get down the concept, we don't have to refer to that math over and over. Okay? So let's say you have a vector, and we know that a vector can be represented by its components. So let's say you got the vector A, it will have a component in the x direction, and that's i hat, plus a component in the y direction, j hat, and you can have a component also in the z direction, k hat. So let's not worry about that, we can easily just add a component. And let's say you have a vector here b, and it is the vector b, it has an x component, and it's i hat, plus a y component, by, and you got j hat. So for example, example. Let's say, I'm going to draw my two vectors here. Here's the x-axis, and here is the y-axis. Let me label one, two, three, four, five, six. That's enough. One, two, three, four, five, six. And the same thing for y. One, two, three, four, enough also one two three four five let me draw vector a and let's say it has uh, it has a form like this this is vector a this is vector a and uh, let's say it's equal to uh, it has a component, it's two units along the x direction and five units along the y direction. So it's two units along the x, so two i hat plus five j hat, five j hat. And then let's draw vector b. And let's say vector b is, uh, let's say, six by two. And let's draw it in a different color. B, vector B, and vector B is six units along the x direction plus uh, plus how many units along the y? Two units along the y direction, so two j. All right. And let's say the angle that A makes with the x-axis, right, this angle here, let's call it uh, theta A. And the angle that B makes with the x-axis is theta B. And then the angle that A and B make together, it would be theta. And that's equal to theta A minus theta B. That's theta, equal to theta A uh, minus theta B. And that's the angle that they make with each other. Okay, so here is the definition of the dot product. Uh, 
uh, before I do the example, here is the definition of the bound product. We say that the dot product A dot B will simply be, it would be a scalar. You get a vector, you multiply it by a vector in this special way and it will give you a scalar. And it's equal to the x component of A times the x component of B, the x component of B plus the y component of A plus the y, the y component of B. And if you had the z component, you would also do the z component also. It would be the, the z component of A times the z component of B added together. So that's just by definition. So for example, if I want A dot A itself, A dot itself, it will give me AX times AX, so that's AX squared, right? In instead of having A and B, I just have A and A again. So it'll be AX times AX plus AY times AY. So plus AY times AY, that's AY squared. And if you remember, to find the magnitude of the vector A, you will do AX squared plus AY squared. So this is just the magnitude of the vector A squared, which we symbolize like this, if you remember, uh, or if you, uh, or we put absolute values on it, squared, okay? And, and then, uh, so for example, in, in our instance here, if, uh, if the vector A is uh, two i hat plus five j hat, and the vector B is six i hat plus two j hat, Let's find their dot product for these two vectors. It will be the x component of A times the x component of B plus the y component of A times the y component of B. Let's see what we get. If you have, um, let's see, the x component of A is 2, the x component of B is 6, the x component of A is 5, I'm sorry, the y component of A is 5, the y component of B is 2. And so you get what, 2 times 6 is 12, plus 5 times 2 is 10, and so you get just 22. That's it. It's just a scalar. Okay. Now, there is a different way to uh, write down the, uh, the dot product in terms of the angles themselves. In terms of the angles uh, themselves. All right? And so... Let's look there and find out what the angles, um, if you have a vector A, let's say, if you have a vector A, let me just redraw that, x, y, and here is vector A. So here is vector A, and it makes an angle theta A with the x-axis. Then we know that the x component of A will be A cosine of theta, theta A, and then the y component of a will be a times the sine of theta a, right, in general. Uh, and then similarly for b, it will be, uh, if you have a b here, a vector b, and it makes an angle theta b with the x-axis. In here, I specifically gave you the numbers 6 and 2 and so on. We could figure the angle uh, itself, but let's not do that uh, at the moment. So we will get the x component of b will be uh, b uh, times the magnitude of b, whatever it is, times the, uh, the sine of the angle b. And the y component of b will be the magnitude of b times the cosine that the angle that b makes with the x-axis. So what's the dot product? dot product of a dot b in general. I want to write it in terms of angles now, their magnitudes and angles. It would be ax times bx, right? The x component of a times the x component of b, ax bx. So what is ax bx? Well, the x component of a is a cosine theta a, and the x component of b is b cosine of theta b. Plus, 
the y component of a is a sine of theta. I'm using this sine theta a, and then the y component of b is b times the sine of theta b. You have a b a b. You just factor that out, and so that gives you a b, and then uh, you would have the cosine of a, the cosine of theta a times the cosine of theta b plus the sine of theta a times the sine of theta b. And you may remember from trigonometry, this is the cosine of the difference between the two angles. And so it's equal to a b, a b times the cosine of theta a minus theta b. And so you get a b times the cosine. The difference between the two angles is the angle the two vectors make with each other. That's theta. So that's another way to write down the, the dot product. A dot B. So just a different way. So if I give you the magnitudes of the vectors and the angle they make with each other, you could calculate the dot product that way. So this is just they're just equivalent. It depends on which one you want to, uh, which one is convenient to use. Um, if you're given the components of the vectors, then this is easier to use. If you're asked to find the angle between them, you would first find the dot product and then uh, find, find the angle. So for example, let me show you an example here. If I ask you, I say, what is the angle that these two vectors make with each other? What's the angle between A and B? What would you do? You would first find the dot product AB. So in our example over there, the dot product A dot B is 22. So for, for example, in our example there, example, we got A dot B is 22. I want to find the angle. So I know the left-hand side, that's 22. Let me find the magnitude of A and then the magnitude of B, and then this will be the only n now. The, oh, here, what's the magnitude of A? A, A without the vector sign, it means just the magnitude of A. What is it? Well, it would be the x component of A squared plus the y component of A squared. So what's the x component of A? That's 2 and the square. And the y component of A is 5 and you square it. And so you get, what, uh, 4 plus 25, that's the square root of 29. And then for the magnitude of the vector b, would be the x component of the vector b squared plus the y component of the vector b squared. And you get, uh, what's the x component of b? It's 6, so 6 squared plus the y component of b, that's 2, and the square, and you take the square root. And what do you get? 36 plus 4, that's 40, so the square root of 40. So, let's use this result to find the cosine. So we get the cosine of theta will be a dot b divided by a times b. Right? By a times b. Well, a dot b is the dot product, and we found that it's 22. And then a times b, you get the square root of 29 times the square root of 40. And so theta will be the cosine inverse of this stuff here, of 22 over... 29 square root of 40. And you can find it if so. Let's see what it is. Um, let me put cosine inverse of 22 over. 
Um, do I have the square root function? Uh, let's see. Yeah, let's do it this way. I get about 49.76 degrees. Let's write it. 49.76 degrees. All right, that's it. Uh, does that look reasonable? Yeah, I think it looks fine. Yeah, it looks reasonable. Because we can verify it. We can find theta A. How do I find theta A? It will be... Uh, yeah, let's just double check, just so, while we're here. Uh, theta A will be the tangent inverse of the y component of A divided by the x component of A, right? So it would be 5 over 2. Let's do that. Uh, tangent inverse of 5 over 2. That gives me 68.2 degrees. And theta b will be tangent inverse of the y component of b over the x component of b. So that's for b, it's over there. It has an x component of 2 and a y component of, I'm sorry, x component of 6, y component of 2. So it would be the y over the x, 2 over 6. And so you get a uh, so tan inverse of 2 over 6. And that gives me 18.43. And rounding, and so theta will be theta a minus theta b. If you subtract these, and that gives me forty-nine point seventy-six. Yeah, forty-nine point seventy-six. Forty-nine point seventy-six approximately. So they they check. All right, and all right. So why are we doing this? Well, we'll get to the work done. So let's look at uh, the work done by a force and then uh, see what happens. We'll start with 1D and then we will generalize our result. So to start the concept of work, um, imagine you take a, a mass M here. Here is a mass M. And let's say the mass is at x1 here, and then we move it here, so it's at x2, all right? And let's say I apply a force, a force this way, all right? Force this way. And let's say the angle here is theta. I'm moving it this way, so that is the mass. And let's say the mass has a speed at this point is V1, and the speed at this point here is V2. And let's say the force for now is constant. It's a constant force. If it's a constant force, then the net force on the object, right? If there are several forces, you have to find the net force and then find the, uh, and then find the acceleration. So this force here will have two components. One of them is perpendicular and one of them is parallel. Which part of it causes the acceleration in the x direction? Well, I mean, again, you have mg, you have a normal force, and you have the y component of this. But those are in the y direction, and there is no motion in the y direction. We're assuming we're moving along the x. So it's the x component of this force that is causing the acceleration. So we got the net force in the x direction is the x component of this force will equal to the mass times the acceleration in the, in the x direction. And uh, so this will be, uh, so the, the acceleration will just be the x component of this force. Let me just keep calling it f sub x divided by the mass. All right. And if I want to find what the speed here is or the relation between the speed and displacement, I know that the, uh, with motion at constant acceleration, you get v2 squared minus v1 squared is equal to 2 times the acceleration times x2 minus x1. x2 minus x1 is the distance traveled. Is the distance traveled. Let me, I will write it. So you get 2. Uh, by the way, I'll replace the acceleration by the x component of f uh, divided by m. 
x component of f divided by m. This is the displacement, or yeah, from here to here, that's the displacement. And then at the, I have here v2 squared minus v1 squared. I will multiply both sides by m and divide by 2, so I will have 1 half m v2 squared minus 1 half m v1 squared equals to the x component of f times d. And the x component of f, the x component of f will be the magnitude of f, right? The x component of f will be the magnitude of f times the cosine of theta. So it will be the magnitude of f times the cosine of theta. And here I have d. Okay? I have d. And so this is equal to 1 half m2. Uh, I'm sorry, 1 half m v2 squared minus 1 half m v1 squared. So notice this, uh, this thing here, the force times displacement times the cosine of the angle. A, B, cosine theta. That's like the dot product between two vectors. And you notice here, Yes, we have our displacement is in this direction. That's the displacement. It's in that direction. And the force is in this direction. And this is theta. And so the force, when you take the dot product with the displacement, I'm calling D, will give me F D cosine theta. And so this is the work done. We call this the work work done by this force. Okay. And before we uh, go on, this combination here, 1 half mv squared, is, uh, will be defined. It will be called the kinetic energy. We'll just define it. The same way we define this quantity to be work, we will define this quantity here, 1 half mv squared, to be uh, uh, to be uh, uh, to be the kinetic energy of an object, okay? And the reason, uh, or actually, when you define something, uh, you can define things for no reason, but usually you have a reason. So definitions are neither right or wrong, they're definitions. And so we will just call this kinetic energy. We will just name it kinetic This combination, 1 half mv squared, will just be called the kinetic energy. It will be given the symbol k, and it's equal to 1 half mv squared. So, 1 half m, the v2 squared, will be the kinetic energy at, spot, at point 2, at this, at this location. And 1 half mv1 squared is the kinetic energy at this location. Right? Again, it's a matter of definition. It's neither right nor wrong good, no, it's not good, not bad, uh, but it turns out to be very useful, and that's why we define it this way. All right, so we, we will get in fact, the kinetic energy 2, K2, minus the kinetic energy at step 1, will equal to the work done. Equal to the work. Work done. So, this is called the work energy principle, and we will see that it's more general than that. We derived it for specifically a constant force, but we will see that it works even for forces that are variable, even when the force is changing. Uh, it's still equal to the work done on an object is equal to the change in kinetic energy of that object, even if the force is not constant. Now, work, the work done could be positive, negative, or zero. The work done will be positive if the angle is between 0 and 90 degrees, less than 90 degrees. The work done will be negative if the angle is between greater than 90 degrees up to 180, up to 180. That would be negative work. And you can see why it's negative. So for example, if I have a mass this way, and I apply a force in this direction, and that force causes motion in this direction. So the force and the displacement, 
the force is doing some work because it's pushing, it's doing positive work because that force is causing an acceleration in, uh, in one of its directions, one of its, along one of its components. So it's doing positive work. If the object is being displaced this way, and the force is this way, then the force is not doing any work. It's equal to zero. Because you're applying a force vertically, but the object is moving to the right. So the force is doing no work because it did not cause any motion in its direction. So that force is not doing any work. Okay? It did not cause any motion in that direction. Work then could be negative if the displacement is this way, and let's say the force is this way. Well, you're applying a force to the left, it, so it has two components. One of them is perpendicular. There is no motion in the perpendicular direction, so that part is not doing any work. And then there is this component of the force. You apply a force to the left, but the motion is to the right. So you're doing negative work. You, the object is moving against your, your will. So if, you, if I have something really heavy and it drops, yes, I'm applying a force upward, but the object just drops. Or if there is a car, uh, let's say downhill or something, and I want to stop it and the car is pushing me, yes, my force is this way, but the motion of the car is this way. So the work I'm doing on the car would be, would be negative. Okay. Now, what are the units of work? The units of work would be, well, you can say kilograms and then uh, meters squared per second squared for speed. Or you can look at it from this side here, force times distance, so it's newtons times meters. So the units of uh, work and kinetic energy, they're the same, work and uh, kinetic energy. Well, they are uh, newtons times meters, right? Newtons times meters. Newtons times meters. And we call that a joule. One joule. One joule. That is called one joule. All right? And before I go on and do variable forces, uh, I would like to do a simple uh, example. And... Uh, uh, yeah, let me let me do a simple example. Let's say I have an object that's five kilograms, and I apply a force that's this one. Let's say the the object. Uh, in fact, let me go to the whiteboard because I'm running out of space there. There's an example here. So here is five kilogram, and it's on a frictionless surface, and I'm applying the force this way. And uh, let's say it's uh, 60 degrees, and the force is 10, uh, 10 newtons. And so, of course, there is gravity this way, mg. And that's equal to 5 times 9.8. And that gives me uh, 49 newtons. And then there is the normal force this way. And uh, my object goes all the way here. All the way here. And let's say V1 is 0. And V2 is equal to question mark. I want to find V2. So I could use Newton's laws to find it. But I'm going to use the work the work done. So work, remember, work was the force times distance times the cosine of the angle between them. So the work done, uh, the work done by, by gravity would be the force of gravity times the displacement, displacement D. And by the way, let's say the displacement it moved from here to here and the displacement is, uh, uh, let's say, five, five meters. Yeah, I guess I'm liking the number five today. Uh, or 
that did not make sense because there is a five. Let me make it eight, two meters. All right, two meters. Two meters times the cosine of the angle, the angle between them. Um, the force of gravity is whatever it is. Let me just keep it as force of gravity, and then the distance is let's keep it as d because it won't matter. Times the cosine of the angle between them. Now gravity is down and and d is this way, so they make 90 degree angle. So 90 degrees, and so that's zero. Cosine of 90 is zero, so gravity does not do any work. Which makes sense. The motion is this way, but gravity is down, so it's not causing any motion this way, so it's do doing zero work. Uh, the work done by the normal force will be the normal force times d times the cosine that the norm of the angle that the normal force makes with uh, with d. The normal force, let's keep it as n. I don't even need to know about it. D is 2, but we don't have to write it. And then the cosine of 90 degrees also, because the normal force is this way and the displacement is this way, so they make 90 degree angle with each other. You might want to say it's really 270 for the force of gravity. It doesn't matter because cosine of 270 is also 0. So you end up with 0 in both cases. And then the work done by this force F will be the force F times the displacement times the cosine of the angle they make with each other, which is 60 degrees. The force now, I need to replace it, it's 10. And then times uh, D, which is 2, times the cosine of 60 degrees. Okay, cosine of 60 is a half, and then times 2, that gives me a 1 times 10, so that gives me 10. Work is, remember, it's in joules, so J, joules. So now, what's the speed? I know that the change in kinetic energy, the kinetic energy at the end minus the kinetic energy at the beginning will equal to the work done, the work done, total work done. Total work done is 0 plus 0 plus 10, so it will equal to 10. And the kinetic energy at the beginning is 1 half mv squared, but v is 0, so this is 0. So I get 1 half mv2 squared will equal to 10. And so v2 will equal to what? Well, the mass is 5, so you'll have 2 times 10, that's 20, divided by 5, that's 4. And then the square root of 4 is 2, so 2 meters per second. That would be the speed. All right, I will stop this video here and go to the next one.